Okay, welcome to episode 71 of the Apple Podcast by MaxFuture.com. This is Lex, and this is a podcast that's commercial-free, that's just done for the love of technology. And it's Friday the 13th, 2011, and there's, you know, various stuff to talk about, Apple and Apple stuff. So let's get to it. Okay, so the first story that really affects Apple in some way is the story that came out earlier this week that Microsoft is buying Skype for $8.5 million. And your question may be, how does this in any way affect Apple? Well, first of all, let's think of what Skype is. Skype is this incredible service that hundreds of millions of people use, mainly because it's free. It's a voice over IP solution to talk on the Internet. But you can also make calls to landline. And it's got apps that run on the iPhone, Android, all sorts of devices, as well as computers. It's somewhat ubiquitous. And Microsoft is paying all cash, $8.5 billion for Skype. And I think this does impact Apple. One, if Microsoft decides to cut Skype and not allow it to run on the iPhone or iPad, that could hurt iPhone or iPad or even Mac sales if it's not allowed on a Mac. Let's say Microsoft's intention with Skype is to just have it run on Windows stuff. But Steve Ballmer, the head of, um, of Microsoft, basically said no. He's going to continue to support Skype being open platform and on many different platforms. Um, and I think as long as they don't cut it from Apple products like the iPhone, like the Mac, like the iPad, uh, that it's not going to hurt Apple. But it could also help Apple, and here's how. Um, in recent months, I've noticed a lot of people complaining about Skype, and particularly the latest Skype application on the Mac, I guess version 5. And I listen to various other podcasts, and people I really respect, like Andy Notko, Leo Laporte, they've all been complaining of you know problems with Skype, that it's failing, they use it a lot for video conferencing and video chats for video podcasts where the guests are remote. And a lot of people have been complaining about the quality. Now, also, a lot of people are going to be very nervous about Microsoft owning Skype on the perception that that Microsoft is going to screw up Skype and not, you know, that Skype is going to deter- deteriorate. And S- Microsoft has purchased some some enterprises, you know, and they've gone downhill or out of business. Like, remember the danger phone? Well, um, that, that danger phone is, um, um, that danger phone is no longer, and Microsoft sort of killed the project. So a lot of people may be getting nervous about Skype under Microsoft's control. Now, Apple has a really a competitor to Skype, and that's FaceTime. And FaceTime started out just being a video calling thing that you could do on the iPhone 4 to another iPhone 4. Then in the past year since the iPhone 4, Apple's expanded it, so there's a FaceTime client beta on Snow Leopard for the Mac. There's also FaceTime on the iPad. And we know that FaceTime is going to be part of... of, of um, of Lion, Mac's operating system, Lion. Now, Steve Jobs had said that FaceTime was going to be open and let other people write, I guess, applications or have devices that run FaceTime, but we haven't really seen that. And this would be a great opportunity for Apple to make FaceTime replace Skype in a lot of people's minds as a fantastic tool for voice over IP and video calling. So what does Apple need to do for that to happen. First, Apple needs to commit and execute on its pledge to have FaceTime be like an open platform that other entities and people can plug into and have it work. One of the thing that's one of the things we should see is have FaceTime compatibility with things like um, AOL's AIM chat client and even Skype. And also let third party apps take advantage of FaceTime and runs FaceTime. The other thing we need is FaceTime to have the ability to, um, I guess, make overseas calls for very little money. Right now, you can FaceTime to another iPhone 
uh, Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, but wouldn't be wouldn't it be great if you could have a voice over IP service over FaceTime and make ch- very cheap calls overseas? That's one of the big things about Skype that people like. It's a really a cheap and reliable form of communication. So I think this is an opportunity for Apple to step up and allow FaceTime to become the new standard over Skype, particularly if there is a perception that Skype has gone downhill, and particularly if it looks like Microsoft is going to screw up Skype. So that's my view. Okay, so the other big thing that happened this week, or one of the big things, is that Google had its famous annual I.O., Google I.O. conference, where it invites a lot of developers and other Google people to come and see new things that Google is introducing. And this year's Google had some things that, you know, are highly competitive with Apple and also highly competitive with Microsoft and others and Amazon. And one such thing is that Google announced that it's launching Music Beta Cloud Service. And what Music Beta is, is that Google, by invite only for now, is going to offer a cloud-based storage for your music, and that'll it'll let you upload up to 20,000 songs using software for the Mac or Windows. And it's a cloud-based system, and then you'll be able to stream the music over the Internet. And um, now what's interesting is people are a little bit shocked by this announcement by Google because... Google's not offering a music selling service like Amazon where you can buy digital tracks online and have them put in your digital storage. Instead, it's just storage for you to upload your MP3s or other digital files and then stream them. So a lot of people think that what happened was that Google couldn't come to term with music publishers over the licensing. Now, they went a different route. Amazon couldn't come to term with music music um, publishers and license, but Amazon did go ahead anyways and say, if you buy an MP3 song from Amazon, it'll go into your digital locker if you'd like, and you can also upload and get five gigabytes for free if you want to upload your own music. So what this means is that Apple is definitely probably going to be coming out with something soon. My take is that Google, like instead of continuing to try to negotiate licenses with the music publishers, felt pressured to come out with some sort of music digital locker announcement. Now, I've asked for an invite. I haven't gotten it yet from Google's music beta. Um, but, um, you know, it should be interesting. I just don't know how how much people are going to want to up upload their existing music because it takes a long time to upload over slow bandwidth um, you know digital files remember most people who have cable their upload speed is only a fraction of their download speed I have Time Warner cable and I think I have at most one megabit per second upload speed while I have download speeds of you know I don't know 20 megabits per second so this could be a real challenge for people. Now, on the other hand, if you were going to just buy musical tracks, if you can download them and have them stream from the Internet, that would be a plus. Now, a friend of mine recently purchased a, a song on Amazon, and, and Amazon gave him the choice of having that song go to the digital locker or download. I don't think Amazon service allows both. But I think that's what Apple should do is have both, where you can get a downloaded copy and plus you have a copy online. And we don't have anything like that from Apple yet where you can get a copy of your music streaming online. But a lot of people think it's going to come very soon. So we'll have to see. Now it seems like um, the music companies want Apple to step in, according to an article by MacRumors.com and apparently sources are saying that the music labels are hoping that Apple can force Amazon and Google into cloud licensing because it looks like Google as well as Amazon has not licensed anything from the music companies for this cloud streaming service. 
And Mac Rumors on May 11, 2011, said the following, With Amazon and now Google having rolled out cloud-based music hosting services with the consent of music labels, CNET reports that labels are reportedly now looking for Apple to become the driving force to bring those companies back to the negotiating table for broader licensing deals. And the quote from CNET is, since neither company was either able or willing to obtain licenses from the four major label companies, neither of them could deliver the same range of options that Apple will be able to offer with its upcoming cloud service, according to multiple music industry sources. Exactly what those options are, the sources wouldn't say. Nevertheless, the hope in the music industry is that Apple's music service will make the competing offerings look shabby by comparison and force Amazon and Google to pay the licensing rates the labels are asking. So it would be kind of ironic if Google and Amazon screw up this whole music streaming thing because they never license from the music companies because the irony is that the music companies have been afraid and resent Apple for being the 800 pound gorilla in the digital music world. You know, Apple's iTunes I think accounts for something like 70 or 80 percent of all digital music sales. And the story in past years has been that the music labels have been giving Amazon a break in giving Amazon sweet deals on the cost of MP3s. And also remember, the music labels gave Amazon the first ability to sell uh, DRM-free music. So it is kind of ironic in the end getting screwed by Amazon and Google will make the music companies um, happy to sell their stuff through Apple's digital locker. So we should be seeing something, I guess, in June when Apple has its WWDC conference for developers. So that should be really interesting. Okay, so the other big news from Google I.O. is that Google announced that it will be soon shipping what is the successor to the CR48. The CR48 was a notebook that essentially only had a browser in it, the Chrome browser made by Google. And now Google is announcing that partners of it like Samsung and I think uh, Acer are going to be selling um, notebooks, light notebooks that have flash memory and that don't have an operating system. They just have a Google, a Google Chrome and they're going to be called Chromebooks. And um, I mean, this is big not only for Apple, but for Microsoft. And, and so basically, what's interesting is they're going to offer it two different ways one for sale, and the sale price is generally somewhere around, you know, between 450 and 500 bucks for one of these Chromebooks that have essentially very limited storage and can only work. Um, through the cloud because they're just a browser in it and they have two types of pricing they for students students are going to be able to rent one of these Chromebooks for just twenty dollars a month but with a commitment of three years of renting it and during the three years if the device breaks it'll be replaced or fixed and they'll have a right to upgrade to a better device in three years and the same for enterprise that they'll be able to license I guess one of these devices just for 28 bucks a month um, and actually now it says the first Chromebook will start at only three hundred forty nine dollars and be available June 15th from Amazon and Best Buy and so this is big because what this is is it's it's a threat not only to uh, Apple but it's a big threat to Microsoft because Google is trying to basically destroy the operating system platform now Apple it's a threat to Apple in this sense Apple is already has a threat to the traditional operating system because it has iOS devices but iOS devices are still an operating system and Apple does have um, you know traditional operating system in the Mac OS but this cheap browser based uh, laptops that are 400 bucks and um, licensing to enterprise for $28 a month for three years including service is a threat to Microsoft's business 
particularly if Google can convince businesses and enterprise to use these browser-based computers. Um, the selling point Google has is that they're easier to service because there's no operating system. Everything can be controlled through the cloud. The hard sell, though, for a lot of enterprise establishments like government as business is that everything is in the cloud. So do do businesses with sensitive information, are, are they going to feel comfortable to have all their information in the cloud? So this is going to be interesting. It's going to be a... Um, it's also a big challenge to Apple's iPad business because one of the great selling points of the iPad is that it's a great browsing device and browsing on the internet and uh, you know the starting price of an iPad is around five hundred dollars so I could see some people who are not big computer users or who just want to get their email and just go online uh, getting this Chromebook you know that's under four hundred dollars so you know it's very interesting to see what happens I think this is going to make the whole mobile computing environment highly competitive now the site cult of Mac took a little bit of a swipe at these Google Chromebooks and um, cult of Mac had an article early this week on May 11th entitled Google's new Chromebooks are a little like MacBook welfares. And I guess what he's saying is they're sort of like a cheap, cheap, crappy version of a MacBook Air. They're actually heavier than a MacBook Air. I was looking at the specs. They are, MacBook Air is like a little over two pounds, and these are closer to three pounds. One thing they have, you can get these Chromebooks also with 3G cell phone connectivity in it and they give you very little um, you know bandwidth per month initially like a couple hundred megabytes so the idea is to entice you to spend more on cell phone connection but overall you know I think they are I think Cult of Mac has it right these are MacBook welfares so Google also announced another threat to Apple earlier this week around the same time as the Google I.O. Uh, on, I guess, um, May 9th, YouTube announced the launch of streaming movie rentals. And according to MacRumors.com, it says that it's taking on Apple's iTunes Store offerings. And the new rental service comes at what's known as industry standard pricing, typically in the range of $2.99 to $3.99. And, you know, some of the movies that are available include Harry Potter movies, The Green Hornet, The Social Network for $3.99, and The Inside Job. So, you know, we're going to see Google going more head-to-head -head with Apple. So there's a number of ways. It's not just Android devices. It's also, um, you know, competing with iPhone, iOS it's also now this digital music service, and it's also competing and offering content for rent and sale like movies. So we're going to have lots of competition to Apple, it looks like, in the TV and movie rental and selling market. Okay, one of the things a lot of people were reading this week was an article that came out in Fortune, and it... Um, it was by someone named Adam Leshinsky, and it's an article that Fortune put out called Inside Apple from Steve Jobs Down to the Janitor, How America's Most Successful and Most Secretive, um, most secretive Company. Let's see. Let me go to the front cover. Um, Inside Apple from Steve Jobs to the janitor. And so the article says how America's most si successful and most secretive big company really works. And essentially what Fortune did was sell this article for like a buck on Amazon's Kindle. And that's where I read it. 
I guess they, they felt this was a very important article. But basically, Lashinsky spoke to a lot of people who used to work at Apple and tried to paint a portrait of what goes on at Apple and what makes it so successful. And the article had a number of interesting points. One point is uh, that how you know Steve Jobs has a temper. And I don't think anyone is surprised that Steve Jobs has a temper. But the story is that when Apple redid the um, Mac.com website and rolled out Mobile Me several years ago, you know, it was it was somewhat of a critical flop. And Apple got word, you know, from the feedback that it was a critical flop. So the story goes that Steve Jobs, you know, gathered a meeting of the people who were responsible for Mobile Me, and he walked in and he said something like, can someone tell me what Mobile Me is supposed to do? And according to this article, when someone explained what mobile me was supposed to do and then steve jobs shot back and said well why the f doesn't it do that you know and then replaced the guy who was like the head of the mobile me operation i don't know why i don't know why this is big news in corporate america a lot of ceos are tough managers and when there's some public flop you know flop in some product heads generally roll. So I'm not surprised by that. Uh, There are other interesting aspects of the article. Um, One interesting aspect of the article is the organization of Apple. It's not anything like GE. Apparently Steve Jobs doesn't believe in matrix reporting, but rather direct reporting, which ultimately is direct reporting to him, and that he knows he can go out and you know, reach out to people directly. Uh, and there isn't this sort of cross matrix like reporting, which I think makes sense. The other thing that I had never heard of is apparently Steve Jobs has something known as the top 100. And, and the article says that every year or so, Jobs gaz- gathers the select 100 people for an intense three day strategy session at a proverbial secure undisclosed location and the 100 could be like the people who are ranked really up there but it doesn't have to be and apparently sometimes the 100 includes people who are stars who are lower down on the corporate ladder and they're just taken nobody internally knows that there's going to be this meeting and just people are told to meet at apple and a bus takes them to a location and according to the article The location, usually resort, always has good food and um, and no golf courses. So I guess Steve Jobs finds golf courses to be a distraction. And that it's, you know, you really, if you're on this, like, group of 100 where you're sort of told every year, like, hey, this is where we're going in terms of direction and our views and our thoughts, if the next year you're not in the 100, it's like a terrible thing, like you've really fallen down and it's embarrassing, but but ba- but basically, you know, it sounds like a place where uh, people are given a lot of responsibility. The other thing the article mentioned was that when they were porting Safari to the browser, I mean to the iPad or to the iPhone, they they gave the assignment to just two people. They didn't have a whole team of people building, you know, the Safari browser to the iPad. So even though it's a huge company with like $65 billion in, in you know, in the bank, um, it still operates kind of leanly in terms of staffing, in terms of projects and teams. And, and one important thing that comes out of this is that whenever there's a meeting about a project, it's made clear that like a particular person is responsible for the project rather than a whole group of people being responsible. So one person at the meeting is the person ultimately responsible. So if you had a question about the project, it sounds like you could ask that person. So I don't know if it's worth paying a dollar for the, for the, um, for the download, but it's interesting. One of the other things that it talks about is that it's everyone's very specialized. They don't believe in sort of general managers. You know, ma- managers are adept at many different things, but 
they like to have managers who are just specialized in a particular area and it's across the board. And it, and it gives examples. For example, there's someone who's in charge of maintaining like the website, but that person has is not allowed to pick the photos that go into the website. Rather, there's someone who's a specialist on images and photos who's responsible for photos all across Apple's business, whether it's on the website or somewhere else. Similarly, it gives an example. There's a guy who's in charge of all the retail stores, but he's not in charge of what products go into the stores, just the layout of the stores, how they're managed, etc. There's another guy, the chief operating officer, who's in charge of all the products and where the products go and how many products are made and, and the inventory and all of that. So it's interesting, this division of layer. And obviously, there's got to be something unique about Apple that makes it so successful. And so it's not going to be managed and run like another corporation. Now, one other thing was discussed at Google I.O. and you know, Google trumpeted how many Android devices there are and, you know, uh, new tablets are coming out. And, you know, they gave out stats showing that, you know, the Android devices are overtaking iOS devices. And GigaOM, a, a website that I read a lot, had a very interesting article entitled, Google's Victory is Not Apple's Defeat. And the point of it was that the entire market is growing and Apple continues to grow. And so they they don't really point out how Apple has been successful. Um, so, for example, it says to put those numbers and, you know, for it gives these numbers, it's over according to um, the Google people. Google and Android have won, at least in the market share. But then GigaOM points out, but that's not the whole story, at least not going by Google's Android numbers from yesterday. 100 million activated Android devices, 200,000 free and paid active applications available in Android market, 4.5 billion applications installed from Android market, 400,000 new Android devices activated every day. And then GigaOM says, to put those numbers in perspective, it took Apple three years to sell 100 million iOS devices compared to two and a half years for Google and Android. It took 22 months for Apple to reach 200,000 apps and 4.5 billion downloads, 30 months for Google to do the same. For whatever reason, the Android market has been slow to launch internationally in about as half as many countries as Apple, but both companies cover the major markets. More importantly, what's missing from Android's bullet list of accomplishments is revenue data. And then it goes on to say, According to IHS, app revenue for 2010 clearly favors, favors Apple's App Store by an enormous margin, and apparently there are no shocking numbers from Google to suggest that, that this has changed much. Um, as reported last month, Apple paid out $2 billion in revenue to developers. Look, I think the reason iOS devices are, are so ubiquitous now is because Google doesn't charge anything to distribute the iOS operating system and a lot of cheap iOS devices are being offered for sale. I think previously I noted, for example, that AT&T on its website was offering Android phones for only one penny with a, with a uh, new two-year subscription. So I just wonder how many of those iOS devices, which are smartphones, were sold at less than $200 out of pocket by the consumer. Because for a brand new iPhone, you're going to have to pay $200 for a subsidized phone. So out of pocket, you pay at least $200. And so I think, in a way, Android devices have become the phone for everyday person who doesn't want to pay out of pocket much money. So why doesn't Google break that down? Google should break down the number of Android devices that have been sold where the out-of-pocket cost at the time of sale is under $200, because I bet you that's a significant difference. Okay, well, location gate seems to be fizzling out. Earlier this week, uh, a Senate hearing led by the comedian turned Senator Al Franken took place. 
and it concerned Google and Apple tracking consumers through the Android and iOS devices. And Apple sent uh, its V Vice President Guy Tribble to Washington. He testified. And basically, he pointed out that Apple does not track user locations, pointed out that Apple has upgraded the iOS to 4.3.3 so that that geolocation cache that was there that was so controversial has been reduced and encrypted and eventually you won't have it at all um, and nobody really cares about this this was sort of much ado about nothing um, Tribble said quote we do not share customer information with third parties without customers our customers explicit consent Apple does not track users locations Apple has never done so and has no plans to do so end quote said Tribble now what's really funny about this is that around the same time it came out that the United States Department of Justice wants to would like mobile providers to start allowing the Department of Justice to obtain records that would enable law enforcement to identify a suspect's smartphone based on the IP addresses collected by websites that the suspect visited. So that's kind of ironic that on one hand senators are questioning Apple about this location tracking thing and on the other hand there's a report out and that report comes from CNET and that came on May 10th that said DOJ wants wireless providers to store user information. So you know it's an interesting area Okay, let's talk about IMAX. And um, as many of you know, last week I talked about new features in the the new IMAX, and that's that they have 6G capability internally with the SATA connections. And why is that significant? Because up till now, other than the very brand new MacBook Pros, the internal SATA connections were 3G. Now, the SATA connection is that connection that could, hooks up to your hard drive internally in a Mac book pro or a, or an iMac and up till now they've had been only 3G SATA compliant I'll translate that for you 3G meant that the speeds that you could get for data read and write to the drive as it connects to the bus of the uh, of the computer was maybe like I don't know 250 megabytes per second read write now that read write speed is critical to fast speed times and um, the 6G allows read write speeds up to 500 megabytes to give you an example the typical hard drive that you have connects and read writes at like 70 megabytes per second so if you go to from 70 megabytes per second read write to 500 megabytes per second read write it's going to really speed up your response time and that's you know what makes things like the MacBook Air much zippier launching applications and stuff like that so what's interesting there's been new discoveries and that is that the chipset in the iMac is something called Intel's latest Z68 chipset and this story is from Mac rumors on on May 11th and the chipset has been apparently highly anticipated for its support, ability to support SSD caching. And what that means is SSD caching would be where you have one drive that's like a regular hard drive, and then you put a smaller SSD drive, not a big SSD drive, but a small one, and let's say, I don't know, 30 gigabytes or so, and then the chipset would allow you to speed up the hard drive by caching and storing data that you use a lot on the caching SSD drive. And the article says, while Apple's new Z68-based iMac does not currently support SSD caching, now officially known as Smart Response Technology, it actually goes further in offering the option of a second 240 gigabyte SSD so, you know, that's an inter interesting twist. But what it means is that potentially Apple could update this Z68 chipset to allow um, this sort of caching. 
And it could be that, you know, a next generation of uh, iMac might have standard built into it a small SSD drive that helps um, speed up the hard drive. See, right now, an SSD drive that Apple offers that option, but it's a built-to-order option that costs at least another $500, which adds a lot to the price of the iMac. So what this is suggesting is that in, if this chipset's in f for future iMacs, Apple might have as a standard configuration in the future a hard drive offered with a small SSD drive, and this would really boost performance. So, you know, this is good technology. But there is some bad news about the new iMacs and um, other world computing, which is a third-party company that does upgrades for your Macs and products, had a blog post on May 12th 2011, which got a lot of attention on the internet, and basically it says, Apple further restricts upgrade options on new iMacs. And what it basically says is, I guess for quite some time, um, if you try to replace the hard drive that comes with your iMac, uh, Apple now has a proprietary heat sensing cable connection that makes it hard to replace and as a result of that, if you replace the hard drive that's in there already, it will cause the fan to go crazy. Now, apparently, this has existed since the 2009 IMAX, but there's been ways to sort of get around it. But now, OWC is saying Apple has changed this sensor cable to another version that's even harder to replace. So really, if you try to replace the hard drive that comes with the iMac, you're taking a big risk that it's going to screw up your, your iMac. Now, this doesn't affect the second connection you have because your iMac has an ability to put a second drive in there. So you could just keep the hard drive that you order with your iMac and just have OWC put in a, a, a SSD drive in the second SATA connection. So that would work. Now somebody pointed out that you know you could you can order from Apple an iMac with just an SSD drive, which I guess wouldn't need a um, wouldn't need a um, a fan. And if that was the case, you know would that make it easier to replace it with a, a big hard drive? I don't know. It's an interesting twist. But, you know, OWC's blog is basically saying that Apple is building your iMac for, you know, to be obsolete because all hard drives eventually die. Now, I have a January 2006 iMac that is now a second computer in the household, and, and that hard drive is still running and working well. So, up till now, um, that hasn't failed, and I guess we're going on to year five. So, anyways, interesting blog post. Now, there had been some speculation in the tech press over the last few weeks that Apple was going to be abandoning in the future the Intel chips that go into the Mac, Mac computers and maybe transitioning to the ARM design chips that are in the iOS devices like the A4 and the A5 chip. And there's been debates back and forth, and one website, CNET.com, has a report out on May 10th that says that Apple is going to stick with Intel for the MacBooks. And in the main reasons, it says it's going to do that are for the following. One, performance. It says that chips based on the ARM designs, such as Apple's A-series processors, won't be able to deliver the necessary performance to keep with Intel's x86 chips. And this comes from, I guess, a, um, um, I guess, uh, an analyst who they're reporting on. It also points out that Thunderbolt, which is in the new computers, which is that new high-speed technology, um, that is an Intel Intel intellectual property, and so the chipmaker is unlikely to license that to ARM. Uh, this comes from a guy named David Cantor 
who I guess works for real world technologies. He also basically says expertise. And he basically says that, um, that Apple is not a chip designer by nature and does not have the expertise to develop the very high performance chips required by MacBook Pros. And then he goes on to say, you know, another reason to stay with Intel is gratuitous complexity. By He says, by adopting ARM chips for its MacBooks, Apple would consequently split its computer lineup, ARM laptops for um, and, and 86, x86 for desktops. And this would result in unnecessary overhead for Apple and consumers. And I think that's right. You know, Apple clearly has a distinction right now between computers like the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pros, the iMac, and the uh, Mac Mini, and the Mac Pro, and then the iOS devices. So I don't, I don't see how Apple is going to, like, divide things up three ways. Uh, now, down the road, it does make sense, according to this guy, that, you know, there would be um, the ability to transition to other chips. Well, we are seeing some sort of transitioning happening, uh, clearly, with the operating system. Lion, which is coming out in June, should further that transition to the look and feel of iOS devices. Okay, so another story in a news a lot this last week, and I guess all year round, is that Apple may be purchasing or licensing all the technology from Nuance. Now, Nuance is that public company that makes the Dragon speech recognition software that's been around for ages and I guess is the leader in speech recognition. And um, there's rumors swirling around that Apple is going to acquire Nuance or that in more recent, um, last week, that it uh, has a massive licensing deal. And, you know, GigaOp has an article and in it they... Uh, on May 11th, they say, well, why doesn't Apple just buy Nuance? Well, according to TechCrunch, Nuance CEO Paul Rickey is a tough negotiator, and Nuance isn't a startup you can just buy without battle, batting an eye. It's a publicly traded company that's currently worth around $6 billion. Um, but look, Apple has $65 billion in cash, so it would be, it would be uh, you know, not easy for that to happen. So, so we'll see. I think it does make sense for Apple to buy Nuance because Nuance has been around for so long. It has all sorts of incredible patents for speech recognition. So I think there's going to be a deal between Apple and Nuance. If, if Apple doesn't buy Nuance, at the very least, it's going to license uh, a lot of that technology because uh, Apple really does need speech recognition um, to expand in the iPhone and the iDevices. And one of the rumors that's been going around is that the North Carolina facility that Apple built, the massive server par- farm, is actually also going to be hosting speech recognition recognition computers for the, for the streaming in the cloud. So a lot of this you're going to see happen around uh, Apple's WWDC in June. And we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Now another story or good news about the iMac was reported in 9 to 5 Mac this week and they discovered that the latest iMac family has Wi-Fi speeds capable of hitting 450 megabits per second and this is the first that the iMac could do that through Wi-Fi and according to the website HardMac, HardMac spotted a reference to this capability in the iMac system information. And apparently Apple changed their app airport card in the iMac, the new ones, and installed three antennas where before there was only two. So before, uh, so you can use three channels at 150 megabits per second. And it says in order to take advantage of the 450 megabits per second data transfer, you need a compatible base station either the current generation airport extreme or time capsule and you want to make sure you connect to the base station using the 802.11n mode on the 5 gigahertz band with the simultaneous dual band mode turned on 
So this is this is you know what this is good for. It doesn't mean anything for connecting to the internet because you're not going to ever use that Wi-Fi speed when you're downloading from the internet. Because for example, that Wi-Fi speed is 450 megabits per second, and your download speed is what maybe 30 or 40 megabits per second at its fastest. But where this comes in handy is if you're streaming video to an Apple TV. Uh, or to um, you know a remote um, a remote computer that also is on Wi-Fi. If you're transferring fi- files on a network, a Wi-Fi network, and they're all running 450 megabits per second, that would make the transfer of video files much easier. Now I don't know if the new airport. Um, I'm sorry if the new um, Apple TVs go with that speed because that would be great if you had a base station that handled that speed and and an Apple TV and an iMac that would mean that you could stream video from the iMac to the Apple TV at incredible speeds so I'm going to play around and test and see how fast does my Apple TV stream okay speaking of Apple TV there was an update release this week for the Apple TV and now the new version is 4.2.2 and you may want to download that according to the update um, the notes from Apple here are the changes audio addresses an issue in which audio is not output when playing some video content video playback addresses an issue in which video is not displayed when playing some content audio up output setting This fix includes, uh, it adds an audio output setting for switching to 16-bit audio for compatibility with some TV and AV receivers. Live FFRW improvements. This improves the performance of fast-forwarding and rewinding live events. Movie description. This addresses an issue in which the description information is not displayed for some movies and YouTube video order. This addresses an issue in which YouTube subscription videos were not ordered by date. So look, some of this stuff is helpful. I would like to sort my YouTube videos, and I would like better improvement on my video playback. So kudos to Apple to fixing this problem. So other news includes um, there was an upgrade to Twitter app for the Mac. This is the official Twitter application. If you're on Twitter, you're probably using it. And Twitter released version 2.1 for the Mac this week. And a lot of people are happy uh, for it. The big change in 2.1 is the possibility to, quote, clone, end quote, any view in a separate window by hitting the triangle icon in the bottom left of the sh- or the shift command T keyboard shortcut you'll be able to open a conversation in a separate view or your direct message, a profile view, a search, anything can be cloned in multiple windows that will sit alongside your main timeline. So this is huge. I mean, it's a huge improvement to the Twitter client. Uh, I'm reading this on MacStories.com. It says, uh, this allows you to have multiple timelines on the screen at the same time, multiple searches, And it goes on to say, I'm pretty sure Twitter power users who need to keep an eye on lots of things at the same time will appreciate this. Um, It also goes on to say there's an updated profile window with new tabs on top and a refreshed direct message view featuring the popular chat bubbles also seen on many iPhone apps. It goes on to say other changes have found their way in Twitter for Mac Mac 2.1. There's now support for AppleScript implemented as well as font size preferences so it's it's gotten much geekier and much more tech tech uh, conscious uh, username and hashtag autocompletes enables you to tweet or mention someone faster from the compose window and the uh, links now work much like the iPhone and iPad apps being displayed as the domain they belong to for example msstr.net without HTT before them. These links are still clickable, but when you copy them, you'll notice they won't automatically append HTTP to the link. So, 
I don't know. This looks like a major, major improvement. I just started playing with it. The cloning of Windows, I think, is the key thing. That's just very cool. Very cool. So it's look, it's free. If you use Twitter, you should download it. So check it out. Another cool app that has come to the Mac is something called Carousel. It's a an app, a Mac app that costs I guess four dollars and ninety nine cents, but what it does, its purpose, it's called Carousel, is to bring your Instagram photos to the Mac desktop. So, you know, Instagram is that app on the iPhone where you can share photos directly with people who, you know, are on Twitter or other or hooked into Instagram, and now those photos will go onto your Mac through this app Carousel that taps into Instagram. So you might want to check it out. It's in the Mac App Store and it's got a cool UI like a carousel. You can quickly flip around through the different pictures. Um, and um, you can also do a free trial of carousel for, via the Mobilux site. So the company's called Mobilux, M O B E L U X. So other news that comes out on this Friday the 13th is that Apple is getting closer to releasing Lion, the, the next uh, OS uh, operating system for the Mac. And it released today, late today, on Friday the, Friday the 13th, uh, Lion Developer Preview Update version 10.7. So this is now version 2.2 and developers can download lion dp3 uh, i have a developer's license it's only 99 bucks a year and it's a good way if you want to just check out ahead of time ios and osx operating systems before they're released so now i'm not going to reveal you know if i download what's in there but some sites are revealing it and, um, you know, there's, there's supposed to be some new UI interface for the, the latest version of, of uh, Lion. And remember, Lion DP3 requires a 64-bit Intel based Mac running either OS X 10.6.7 or Lion DP2, uh, Developer's Preview 2. The update is large. Apparently, it's... 10.7 gigabytes in size and it um, has all sorts of new features among the changes is the addition of the reading list to safari enabling users to save web pages for later later reading this is the feature that's similar to the instapaper service on the internet by marco armand so you know i think everyone should be excited for lion coming in uh, i guess it's going to be released in june so check it out. Check it out. Well, one of the more whimsical pieces of news that came out on this Friday the 13th was reported on TUAW.com. That's the unofficial Apple weblog. And apparently the Guinness World Book of World Records has awarded Guinness World Records to the iPhone 4. And uh, one of the things that it got was the fastest selling portable gaming system. So the iPhone 4, according to Guinness, states that the iPhone 4 first day sales estimate of 1.5 million make it the fastest selling game system in history. By comparison, the PSP only sold 200,000 units in its first day, and the Nintendo DS sold 600,000 units. It also won the most popular application marketplace, the largest downloadable video game store, and the largest launch line up of any Apple gaming system. So kudos to the iPhone 4. You know, this is a very noble and, you know, big deal, I think. Okay, so uh, word comes late on Friday the 13th from Apple Insider that there's a new report claiming that the fifth generation iPhone will be a relatively minor update dubbed 4S. That will bring support for both Sprint and T-Mobile networks in the United States. 
And uh, Apple Insider says this report comes from Jeffries & Co. analyst Peter Misick. And he asserts that the next iPhone is just going to be a minor update, you know, which kind of makes sense because remember the 3G was a minor update to the 3GS and kept the same form factor. And so according to industry checks, this guy claims that the fifth generation iPhone will arrive in September with minor cosmetic changes, according to Apple Insider. It's going to have A5 dual core processor and HSPA Plus support, uh, and also support for China Mobile as well as Sprint and T-Mobile. You know, I think this totally makes sense. Apple doesn't just go whole hog crazy in the next update. It's incremental. It doesn't have to go nuts. And frankly, putting an A5 dual-core processor, which is the same as the iPad 2, is going to really boost the processing power of the iPhone. I mean, the current iPhone 4 has an A4 processor, but a dual core processor in the iPhone will be just tremendous for performance. I mean, I'm still under contract, and I think I would upgrade even if it's an iPhone 4S. And I like the current form factor of the uh, of the iPhone. And you know, I guess some people are going to be disappointed that we're not going to have the world phone capable of connecting to both GSM and CDMA. But eventually, that's going to come. Maybe that'll be the next version of the iPhone. So I think this is very credible. Now, a friend of mine is very bummed because, you know, I previously told him that the iPhone is upgraded every June. And now it looks like this June and it's not going to be upgraded. So he's now, he can get a full subsidy from AT&T. He, he's fulfilled his contract. And um, he's still on the 3GS. So he's looking forward to an upgrade. And... Um, I don't know what to tell him. Should I tell him to like just get the four now or just hold on till September? You know, it's a dilemma that everybody faces who's looking for an upgrade. But hey, those are the um, the marbles that you get when you play with the iPhone. Okay, so before we end this uh, podcast, uh, Cult of Mac, which is looking, I guess, at the new update to, to the Lion update for the Mac report some of the new things that are in Lion Developer Preview 3. There's a new login screen, which has a silvery background and new icons for sleep, restart, and shutdown across the bottom of the screen. And it also features various user interface tweaks, including new wallpapers and the reading list in Safari. Uh, And here's what else is in the preview according to its old tech. There's new options in the system preferences, uh, mission control. There is a new animation when ro- logging into the computer and displaying the desktop. Uh, there are n- new reminders menu in iCal. There's a new next desktop button in dashboard space. There's new options when right-clicking. This appears to be buggy at times, according to them. There's now a, a, a mission control app. There is a finders toolbar that has been slightly updated. The desktop wallpaper has been updated. The, uh, the, and there are new changes in Mission Control. You can add desktops right from Mission Control by clicking the plus button. And close spaces from Mission Control. Mission Control no longer displaying text, text desktop when hovering over desktop thumbnails. Also, the scroll bars now change color depending on the background. A black background equals light scroll bar and vice versa. Interesting. So there's, you know, there's tweaks. So it looks like Apple's getting really close to this line update. Anyways, listen, we're almost to an hour and this has been the Apple podcast. Uh, Episode 71 from, wait, wait, one more story. One more story before we, um, we end it. Um, I just want to mention there's a there's a blog that I read a lot called the Brooks Review, and it had a really good article entitled "The Bomber Days Are Over." Now remember, Microsoft was the evil empire for Apple for so many years, and and um, over at Brooks Brooks Review, he has a good case for why Steve Bomber's days are over. Steve Bomber is the CEO of Microsoft. Microsoft. And his point is, you know, one that I've been making, which is, look, the stock has gone nowhere over the last 10 years and just stays in line with the NASDAQ. Meanwhile, Google stock and um, 
the um, Apple stock has like gone crazy over the last 10 years. And Microsoft under Obama's leadership has just missed the boat. I mean, he totally screwed up seeing the iPhone as a threat. And he famously said, quote, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. No chance. He said this when the iPhone was first coming out. Um, he also, you know, was very late delivering Windows Phone 7. And, you know, he screwed up with the Zune. And, you know, he bought the company Danger for $500 million and then did nothing with it. And, you know, this spending $8.5 billion on Skype seems ludicrous given how much cash it is. Skype only sold for a couple of billion dollars a couple of years ago. And it's not like Skype has been so amazing in the last two years. So what warrants Microsoft paying billions and billions and billions more for this voice over IP, you know, service. Um, anyways, good article. And uh, with that, let's end the podcast. Thanks for listening. And please check out maxfuture.com and my other podcast, the iPad podcast. And um, again, you can email me at maxfuture at gmail.com. Again, thanks for listening.